As a Supreme Court justice, I'm, I'm wondering how you feel about transparency um, uh, in the court. Um, uh, it was an astonishing experience to go to the Supreme Court and hear an oral argument myself, and I thought the world should see what it's like uh, and should, sh this court should be open to everyone. I can understand well, why. Well, excuse me, but it is. It is the most open branch of government because every single thing that court does is explained and you have opinions, long written opinions that tell you exactly the reasoning that went into it, what we're doing and why. Show me another branch of government well, that does that. Well, well <laughs> yeah, that's a, a good point, but a good point, but I guess what I'm saying is that you found it important to know that kids are looking on the internet for 40 hours at things. Wouldn't it be great if kids could actually watch what actually happens on the Supreme Court live, uh, like having television or cameras in the well, court? Well, you must be talking about for the Supreme Court argument, should television be in there? That's right. <coughs> okay. Well, the arguments are interesting in a way, and you can get transcripts by the very same night after the argument occurred, so if you can read, you can see it. In other words, there it is, in print, in front of you. Now, true, it isn't on the television, but that's going to take the agreement of a, of a high percentage of the justices. While I was on the court, we did not have an agreement of the justices that that step should be taken. And I think in part because they did not want to be public figures. They didn't want to be a Cory Booker getting votes. They wanted to concentrate on doing their job, and they didn't think that was necessary. It'll probably happen someday, but it sure didn't happen while I was there, and that's okay with me. Can, can you imagine being an attorney in front of the Supreme Court with Madame <laughs> Justice? Yes, yes, sir, over here. So I can't resist. We have a leading economist, a Supreme Court justice, a mayor of a large city. And uh, we're in an era now where crime is actually declining, both property crime uh, and, and violent crime. And, I'm, uh, and we're in the middle of a recession. So I was curious your points of view on uh, why that is. Uh, well, let me, let me start. I think that part of it is because actually demographically, the biggest bulge uh, we've had uh, in the period of time in a young person's life where they actually are most vulnerable to crime, uh, that big demographic bulge has passed. Uh, secondly, I think that... By that, uh, what do you mean? What do you mean the bulge has passed? Oh, we that, don't have that, as many the or what? Well, the, the, the baby boom, the huge baby boomers Mostly now, criminals. They're not gone. as, they're, <laughs> and, they're in jail someplace. That's right. Most, most, that's right. Most of, them, <laughs> most of them are either in jail, are criminals, or they basically have given up on life. Uh, <laughs> uh, secondly, I, I think that, as Corey said, as Mayor Booker said, there has been some uh, real progress made in terms of giving young people some alternatives. Uh, Community-based policing has worked much better than uh, the old system of kind of uh, a police that kind of cruised around. Uh, we have, I think, made progress in decriminalizing some nonviolent crimes. Uh, part of that is because the prisons have become so crowded. I wish that were not the major reason why we, why we did it. Uh, and so police can focus more on the more violent crimes. Uh, but that's, that would be my two cents. Well, you know, um, crimes are laws that are enacted by popularly elected legislators. And it's, you have a hard time restraining legislators from making up criminal offenses. And the big increase has been with drug crimes and legislators across the country, state and federal, have continued to make serious crimes out of any kind of dealing in drugs. And that's, that's been the big increase. Now, whether that's going to reduce over time or whether drug use will go down, I don't know. But that's where the big increase has been, is with some kind of drugs. So um, last year, I don't know where the gentleman went. He's over there. Uh, so <laughs> wait, raise your hand. Yeah, there you are. So last year, last week, 
So the week that just passed, the same week last year, we had 10 people shot in my city. This year, last week, we had five people shot in my city. Now, woohoo, <laughs> you know? Uh, there was a 50% drop, but when is it gonna come to a point in our country where we think to ourselves that having that level of young men being shot is outrageous? Uh, July 4th, I had an emergency meeting, canceled a, a vacation I had because we had a spike in crime that what often happens, guys come out of prison. In my city, the time you're most likely to be shot is if you've come home from prison in your first six months because you still have a beef with somebody or what have you. Uh, you're trying to get back to your drug trade or what have you. And it was July 4th and we were having two gang wars go at each other. Now the weapons that they had, we had never seen before. My police director who's been 20, 25 years on the force has never seen the, the weapons we recovered that month from, from great, using some really great economic incentives to get tips from my residents. But AK-47s, Tech-9s, he said, I've never seen men in, hold that kind of stash. And they were using these weapons, spraying their enemies. And it, we, we had one day where 14 people were shot in two different incidents. Um, just astonishing. Sat in this room with a US attorney, with a special agent in charge of the FBI, with basically every f uh, uh, police agency you can imagine, from county sheriffs to, uh, to, to, you, to uh, uh, the ICE, uh, um, uh, Immigration t uh, Task Force. All of us in the room, over 100 law enforcement officials. And what was amazing to me was, I, I was sort of sitting back there thinking to myself, oh my gosh, there is literally millions of dollars worth of taxpayer money represented in this room right now. And then they start putting on the, on the, on the uh, screen the 30 guys that were causing this problem. Now sometimes I feel like Thomas Friedman and think, wow, if we were China for a day, we would just arrest all those guys. But as the judge knows, you have to have due process. And so what we're decided to do is, I'm not satisfied with this game where we're seeing these people. And I, I've looked, searched the country for a different way out of this. And this is a little longer, but I'm gonna really try to keep it tight. We found a few places, High Point, North Carolina is one, that instead of seeing a little bit of drops in crime, they virtually eradicated drug dealing in their city by reinventing, being innovative, uh, as social entrepreneurs, when they meet up with venture philanthropists in inner cities like mine, they can do dramatic things. And what they, they did is a professor named um, David Kennedy from John Jay College said, well, what if, when you get those guys on the list, what if you go to them and just say, look, we know who you are. We're gonna either come at you in every way we can within the law, harass you with the police. We're gonna go after your mother for using marijuana, we're gonna, whatever, if you decide to keep doing what you're doing. If you don't, we're gonna wrap intensive social services around you. We're gonna help you get off the streets because it's not glamorous, this is not the movies. Drug dealers in America, it's a horrible job, horrible hours, standing out in the freezing cold, and so on, so it really is, it's a bad job. But if you <laughs> talk to these guys, so anybody here thinking about doing it? Somebody on this stage might have a crystal meth uh, lab in their basement, but um, breaking bad. Uh, but, but, but the point of the matter is, is they did this. They wrapped social services. First, some guys tested it and went out and did crimes, and they brought them all the force. Some guys tried them and saw that, oh my gosh, I could get back on my feet. I could get into something productive. I could so on and so forth. Their, 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 their rates of violent crime in their city dropped to the floor. And so what we're thinking in Newark, we're about to do this. We're about to do our first call in early next month. Of a, of a gang sect in our city and have this conversation. And so what I'm saying is, you say crime is going down, going up, 10% drop in crime in America, is, is we shouldn't be patting ourselves on the back. Um, it, 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 we should not tolerate, we, we've become such tolerant people of such high levels of crime that we think a 10% reduction in shootings is something to, be, to celebrate. It's unconscionable to me that we have children all over America that can tell you about weaponry like you wouldn't believe that could t talk to you about funerals like you wouldn't believe. And the last thing I'll say about that is, I went to a funeral for a young man I knew from my building in Brick Towers. Everybody was there. It was packed to the brim. Teachers and activists, and it was my first month as mayor. It was, it was August, I was elected in July 2006. And I remember standing in the back seeing this, we couldn't move in this funeral home. It's a famous funeral home in Newark called Perry's Funeral Home, famous for the wrong reasons. So many young kids die. And I remember going right back to my, my office my new office as a newly minted mayor, sitting on my couch and saying to myself, I, I can't understand what kind of society would be there in droves for a child's death, but where were they for his life? And, and that is the power that we have, the reservoir of strength and power that we have when it comes to crime in America that we're just not using because we're not bringing the same innovations uh, uh, from the private sector, innovations in technology to bear on our problems, which are infinitely solvable. 
uh, and that we should not be talking next year about a 10% drop in crime. We should be talking about eradicating violent crime from cities, which can be done. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Esther. Thanks. This, this has been so wonderful. I want to provoke another conversation up there in addition. We've, we've talked about crime, and I think early uh, Robert talked a little bit about the failure of politics. All of this, in a sense, is due to the failure of everybody. Yet, I, I was privileged to have dinner with Justice O'Connor six months ago, and she told me something extraordinary, which is that only twice had you disagreed with a jury verdict. Anybody who's been on jury duty knows how inspiring it is, how people actually come together, study the issues, put aside their biases, do their very best. Yeah. So what can you guys in politics and economics learn from the jury system? How can, how can we encourage the broad population, not just our politicians and our police people, to be the best they can be? Let, let me take a stab at that, Esther, because it seems to me that uh, it has to do with our conception of citizenship uh, in this country. Most of us now, uh, we pay our taxes and we respond to jury summons, and that's basically what we understand to be the limits of our... And about a third of us vote. ...and citizens. Uh, well, we complain, uh, but in terms of citizenship, uh, as in terms of sacrifice, uh, I think it might be useful for us to think about how we can uh, become involved in the government decision making in ways that puts, puts us in direct contact with people who are very different from us. Uh, there are some cities and some places around this country that are actually experimenting with uh, citizens, not just advisory groups, but actually citizens groups that look at regulations, that look at various other government actions, and that have a responsibility, not just, again, advising, but a responsibility like jurors do, uh, to try to seek after uh, what is best for their communities. Uh, and that is part of the responsibility of citizenship. It's well, like public service. We have to get people educated about how to be part of government and what they have to do. We need them to vote, and the voting statistics are not good. How are, and it's easier than ever. You can vote by mail. We don't have to go to the poll anymore. And how do we get people to be good citizens and to contribute by voting, to be willing to serve on juries, and to be part of it? These are great ways to make people more responsive to the needs of our current lives. Let's so go, I don't know how we do that. Thank you. Let's go to, uh, is, looks like Jim. Hey, thanks, Eric. Um, since we've got a distinguished panel, thank you guys very much for this conversation. Um, and I was wondering if we might just, since we're just mentioned politics, talk about politics for a moment. Now, we've, some of us talked a little bit about this last night, and I'm looking at you, Mayor, and you're, in your state, you have a governor that's sitting on the sidelines that may decide to run for president or may not. I'm just curious from all the people on the panel what your take is since the election is 13 months away, the presidential election. What do you, who, who do you see as the potential candidate against Barack Obama? And do you see Governor Christie entering the race? Mayor? <laughs> let's, just ask the hard, let's just ask the hardest. And, and remember, I told you it's off the record unless it's really juicy. <laughs> um, I'm, I, uh, full disclosure, I'm, a, I'm a, a Barack Obama supporter and will be out on the campaign trail working very hard. As for am him. I. Okay, and, um, but I will say this, that Governor Chris Christie, in my estimation, would be the best hope the Republicans have against, uh, against Barack Obama. And uh, he's an immensely talented politician. Um, I could do a dissertation on our disagreements that Governor Christie and I have, but he's an honorable man in that he and I sat before when he was governor-elect and said, let's find a few spaces, because everybody's going to expect prominent Democrat, prominent Republican to be at each other's throats. Let's shock people and find areas that we can agree upon and work hard on those and demonstrate success and be a model. And he's been a man of honor on, on all of those issues. And again, I disagree with him on a lot of things, but we've created a partnership and even a friendship uh, beyond politics. And the last thing I'll say is I am I'm despairing, um, but I have not surrendered to despair. I'm still a prisoner of hope, um, but I'm, I'm despairing about the state of our partisan politics in America. 
and I'm sick and tired of knee-jerk affiliations to party that trump common sense. Um, and uh, no party has a monopoly on good ideas. Uh, I celebrate Jack Kemp, for example, as doing some of the best impact on inner city communities through things like empowerment zones. Uh, and I think that there's a tremendous amount of great ideas that are coming from my side of the party. And, and, and maybe I can even pass it over to uh, uh, Secretary Reich on this, because he and I were talking in what was a not quite greenish green room um, <laughs> that, uh, that uh, about the problem with we have a system right now that selects for, uh, that's pushing our politics to the extreme, or as one great author calls it, the wing nuts. Uh, and most of us actually are in the center, and we all really agree on most issues, but our politics doesn't reflect that. It's very broken. And I think this, uh, Professor Reich was talking, talked about everything from the way we draw our electoral districts, to the closed primary systems, uh, to the way we nominate uh, presidential candidates, all working against what I think is the larger and better best interest. And we need to think about structurally changing our democracy so it becomes far more representative of who we are as a people. Well, I think that's right. Most people uh, in this country are not at the extremes. Most people are pretty much at the center. And there's remarkable agreement. I mean, uh, we go out, and <laughs> Justice O'Connor, I'm sure you have the same experience, talk to people uh, and find uh, extraordinary agreement on very controversial issues, but Americans really do want answers. They don't want to just yell at each other. A couple of weeks ago, I was on television uh, debating somebody who, of a different political persuasion, and at the commercial break, the producer in my ear said, be angrier. <laughs> and I said, uh, look, at uh, we're having a very good discussion. We're getting someplace. It's very respectful. I don't want to be angrier. And she said, well, look, at we have millions of people uh, surfing through the uh, stations, uh, through the channels, and they will stop when they see a real angry gladiator type contest. Oh, so God. you've got to be angrier. I said, I don't want to be. She said, you must be. We've got 10 seconds to go back on air. And I... <laughs> I lost my temper. Nine. <laughs> <laughs> and it worked. And it worked. <laughs> it worked. Why don't we, uh, um, we're, we'll, we'll need to pick up the pace. So maybe a couple more questions real And we'll need to do quick. So go ahead. Okay, I'll be as brief as I can. Um, I just want to start by saying I'm speaking from a position of somewhat ignorance around the judiciary system. So I probably could have benefited from that game, although I'm sadly past the age of already being distracted by my hormones. Um, but it's on a, not too late. You can still <laughs> plug in. Thank you. Um, no, but on a serious note, um, I just was hoping you could speak uh, briefly about the case of Troy Davis because I deal with a show uh, that is very heavily relies on social media, and there was an uproar around that case. And when the Supreme Court did step in and delayed the uh, execution. I was confused, and I didn't understand the role of the Supreme Court in these uh, situations. Well, I wasn't there, so I don't know. But it is possible that uh, his lawyers had raised a series of federal issues in the courts below, saying you need to take this case or enter a stay of execution so that we can proceed with the further arguments that we've outlined here. And then the Supreme Court might have the power to say, yes, we will enter a stay until we decide whether we're going to take the case and hear some issue. But in that case, the court did not find um, that it should take the case. And so that was the end of the matter, unfortunately. And just, I'll say every day there are, there are travesties of justice going on within the American justice system because of the quality of counsel available to poor people uh, horrible legal advice. I see it all the time, and you know, witnesses uh, who see things don't always uh, don't always remember correctly what they've seen. So the Troy Davis situation to me is is uh, is grossly uh, unjust. Uh, that there would be such high questions that we would not uh, at least commute his sentence, keep him in life forever. But that's crazy that my government has taken the life of a person that very likely could have been wrong. I'm I'm. It's a very sad day. Let's do uh, yourself, and then let's have the, the two of you be the last two questions. Uh, go ahead. Uh, Mayor, are you familiar with uh, Ben Carson's reading rooms? Ben Car Dr. Ben Carson? I, I, I know of Dr. Ben Carson very well. I'm not sure about his reading rooms. Uh, the reason I'm asking is um, because it's, these are such extraordinary ideas about solving education, and yet you've done it at a, at a local level in a way that you know, none of us have ever heard anyone attack it that way and solve it. 
So anyway, the question I'm asking is Ben Carson, uh, for those of you in the room who don't know him, uh, African-American pediatric surgeon 10 years ago decided to solve the problem of the plight of unemployment and crime by attacking it in inner schools in Baltimore and creating these reading rooms. And there have been the three of them, they're pretty extraordinary because he takes a, and so the reason I'm bringing it up is more of not a statement but a question of how you scale a solution. And well, that's why, so first of all, I will explore this, but please understand that we have not solved the problem in Newark. We have glorious islands of excellence, but our goal, like you just said, is to create a hemisphere of hope. How do we expand the success we're having in Newark? And we are in that fight right now with a collection of philanthropists, with a lot of, um, a lot of great innovators. So these kind of ha things help me. I'm gonna look at Ben Carson's If, if both of you have a chance, Raish, you need to, to just, um, you know, Google, <laughs> go to YouTube. My daughter's Alexis Scanway. She just did a little video of uh, these reading rooms. But it, it's great to see these kids and what they're saying about being inspired to read because if they get inspired to read and they find it fun, they stay in school. And if they stay in school, hopefully the issues that Reich was bringing up is if they finish school, then they won't join the unemployment so, line or the crime. So, so Mayor, uh, Governor Christie, among other things, has been running against the educational unions of, of New Jersey, as best I could tell, in his, in his uh, conversation. Have you had a different experience? Well, we have, Governor Christie and I have very different styles, and... Um, that would be an understatement. That, yes. <laughs> I was uh, once asked a question, I was giving a speech in, up in Buffalo, and the, the, the reporter at, raised her question, the first question was, uh, you and Governor Christie, I told, were told the two politicians in Washington, New Jersey, if Christie gives a speech, you feel like to go out with a battle axe and, and, and attack people. If, when you give a speech afterwards, everybody feels like hugging each other. And he said, what, would you t please tell me what the better strategy is? <laughs> um, so, uh, and of course, I only can think of Nietzsche, it's better to be feared than loved. Um, but, uh, but look, the teachers' unions are here to stay, and another point I want to make point I want to make is in right to work states we, we it's not like we have suddenly much better achievement and so you've got to find a way to get to the table and attack the absurd and I had to do that as mayor of my police union why did detectives and my gang task force work Monday through Friday 9 to 5 well I don't know what cities you guys are from but in Newark the gangs don't work Monday through Friday 9 to 5 <laughs> and so when I stand at one of my toughest schools in the inner city and the first thing the principal said to me when I came on the first day of school is I lost two of my teachers two of my best teachers because of budget cuts, that they were the last ones hired, the first ones fired. So it's crazy. who suffered? That's, that's, that's absurd. Yeah. So, so what we're in discussions right now, because we have an open contract, is really trying to get to the table and understand, to focus on, on kids, to focus on change. Now, Governor Christie will have the final say on our contract, but I believe we can move them very far towards reform. Can I uh, just uh, yeah, ask yes, yes, that quickly? Um, we have got to demand, uh, with regard to our teachers, some accountability with regard to performance. Uh, the false debate we are in right now uh, between pay versus performance is a ridiculous debate. Uh, there ought to be performance measures and we need teachers to uh, actually achieve them uh, or at the worst, they're not going to be teachers any longer. But at the same time, we've got to understand that the law of supply and demand is not repealed at the schoolhouse door. Yes. If we want talented women or men to go into teaching, we've got to pay them enough to get that talent there. And those are two realities, and Absolutely. we don't want to face either and one can, of them. Can I just say this, because I think, uh, uh, Mr. Secretary, you, you, there are so many false debates in our country that the politicians benefit from and the people lose on. So the false debate of testing, nobody wants, thinks we should rely solely on testing. It should be one component along with peer reviews and other things. And never have I been around with education reformers that say we should just be all about testing and, and the like. False debates around guns in this country. Uh, when the Supreme Court overturned the Heller decision, all my friends were all upset on the left saying, oh, now Washington, D.C., you'll be out and go buying guns. I looked in my city and I saw, in all my time as mayor, there's only been one person ever shot with a, with a person that went out and legally bought a gun. Um, uh, and that was, a, that was a correctional officer that used her sidearm to shoot her boyfriend who probably deserved it. And, and so we've created this false de gun debate in our, in, our, in, our, in our country. Meanwhile, we polled, and I say we, Mayor Bloomberg paid for the poll, I take credit for it, uh, 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 but, but Mayor Bloomberg paid for a poll where we polled, used a Republican pollster to poll gun owners in America, and upwards of 80, 90 percent agreed on simple law changes that would choke the supply of these weapons coming up to my community. Like, for example, Secretary Reich, and I don't know if it's true or not, but he could be on the no-fly list for being a suspected terrorist, um, and, and he could be, have made terroristic threats against me in the green room saying, I'm going to get a gun and kill you, but he could still go down to Virginia right 
right now today and go to a gun show, not show any ID, and easily buy all these weapons. Now, the overwhelming majority of gun owners say that's crazy, but we've created a false debate in our country that firms people up on issues when really the, re the pragmatic center gets completely lost because we're not talking to each other and not using, as you said, data to drive our decisions. Yeah. And maybe some new creative solutions like the ones you guys have all discussed. Let's have the, you have the honor of the last question. I'm thrilled. Uh, first, I want to thank each of you for uh, really, truly a uh, mind-stretching uh, uh, e event. Very, very fun. Uh, I'm a small businessman from uh, Denver, Colorado. Our Denver school board is uh, non-functional at best. Uh, one of the problems that I see is that I'm trying to grow my business and things like that. And I ha give myself a very poor grade, and I think there may be others in this room that do the same. Uh, about involvement in local Denver politics or Colorado politics, if you could give me a two-minute lecture on what you would have me do in terms of getting more involved. Well, come on. I mean, there are jillion ways. And do you vote? Do you vote? Well, that's not necessary, but you vote. Do you serve on juries if you have a chance? Well, how is the school board chosen? By voting, and I vote as well. Maybe you should run for the school board. <laughs> <laughs> I want to, that's, I want, can I, can I, can I just say, can I just underscore? <laughs> yes, it is. sounds like a fate worse, his okay. answer is, it sounds like a fate worse than can, death. Can I just underscore what the, what the justice just said, because I, uh, Many of us are, are angry and cynical, and many of us spend a lot of our times whining. Uh, and partly uh, because I'm so short and recognizable, people come up to me in airports all the time who I don't know, and they whine uh, about everything. Uh, and it's pretty depressing. Uh, but it's usually whining about politics and the nation and what I've now started to do is say, well, what are you doing about it? Right. And that is really the issue, because we have a lot of power. Everybody in this room has huge power. Running for the Denver School Board, uh, taking, organizing people who uh, of similar views, uh, being a, gener a genuine reformer, uh, being an innovator, uh, with regard to the social problems we all, all around us. We don't need to rely only on people with formal elected authority. Leadership does not need authority. Leadership is a matter of actually getting people to focus on the problems that bedevil society and not use denial and escapism and scapegoating and cynicism to convince themselves that nothing can be done. And I'll, I'll end with this uh, a simple point. I, I know Denver, I've been out there actually speaking to organized school reform groups. I'm a big believer that big cities like that should not have school boards. Mayoral control, guys like Eli Bro and others said, it's like trying to reform a multi-million dollar system by committee as opposed to having a strong executive. That, I bet you few of your voters can even name school board members. So I, I really believe in those reforms. But I, I really think it starts with jumping in head first, whether it's uh, doing something small like everybody in your office, group, uh, group um, uh, mentoring people in, in, a, in a school, whether it's finding out these organizations. But that's the biggest thing is that people in America, we too often let our inability to do everything undermine our determination to do something. And I'll end with a vignette of the woman I talked to. I had the worst day as a city councilman back in my early, mid-20s. Mid and I, I remember going home, horrible day. A friend of mine had this, was a tenant president of this other part in Newark that had a horribly violent incident. And I'm coming home. I don't know why I'm in politics. I'm really ready to quit. I can't help this woman with her, her drug problem. I was just a councilman. I can't order the police to do anything. I'm horribly giving up. And I walk home, and there's Miss Jones. And she sees me. I don't want to talk to her. So I try to walk past her. She goes, don't you walk past me, boy, without giving me a hug. And I said, OK. And I give her a hug. And she goes, what's wrong? And I vented on her, whined probably louder than you ever heard how horrible politics was, why am I involved in all this? And then I told her about the situation. I said, I just don't know what to do. It's terrible. And then suddenly she looked like she was animated by God. She's like, oh my gosh, I know what you should do. And I said, Ms. Jones, you know what you should do? She goes, yes, I know what you should do. I go, well, what should I do? And she thought for a second. She goes, I know exactly what you should do. And I'm like, Ms. Jones, I don't have time for this. What should I do? And she crosses her arm and says, you should do something. <laughs> <laughs> 
on behalf of Google, on our audience, That's thank the cute. three of you for your extraordinary contributions to America. Okay.